Hello. This is Tuesday, February 13th, 2007. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We are privileged today to have with us Robert B. White. Welcome, Bob. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. May I ask you, Bob, when were you born? I was born November 30th, 1932. And where were you born? I was born in Boston, Mass. And where do you currently reside? What town? Natick, Mass. And you are married? Yes. And do you have children? Yes, I do. How many? Four, four children. Any grandkids? Yes, I have six grandchildren and four great, great grandchildren. Oh That's wonderful. Congratulations. Um, did you grow up in Boston or did you grow up in this no, area? No, I grew up most of my life I spent in Natick. What was Natick like back then? It was great. It was a small town. What do you remember about it as a child? That you weren't crowded out with traffic, that is true. And you almost knew everybody in a sense. Where did you live? What, what street? East Natick. Mm -hmm. And you went to schools in Natick? Yes, I did. Did you graduate from high school? No, I didn't. Did you enter the service from high school? Yes, I did. What year? I went in the service in 1949. How old were you? I just turned 17. Why did you join? Well, I was not college material. I knew that. And so rather than hang around doing nothing, I was planning on going in the Marine Corps years ago, and so I just went to, into the Marine Corps. I didn't miss school at all. And you joined the Marines. Did you join with any of your friends? No, I went in by myself. When you went in in 1949, what was the, the political atmosphere at the time? Was there concern with regards to after World War II communism or anything like that that you remember at the time? No, there was no uh, war in, in sight at that time. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I got in, one more year, and we start getting into the fighting with Korea. And I knew where I was headed. Okay, getting, we'll get back to that in a minute. Why did you choose the Marines over other branches of service? Well, really, it's been in the family. My father was in the Marines. My older brother was in the Marines. My cousin was in the Marines. So there's only one road I was heading down. You wanted to follow the tradition? Yes. When your father was in the Marines, was he in World War II? He was in World War II. Did he ever talk about it? Not really. Not to us kids. Mm -hmm. When you first entered at the age of 17, where were you sent for basic training? Paris Island, South Carolina. Had you ever been out of Massachusetts before that? Oh, yes. Traveled a lot, or? I just traveled down to Florida, up to Canada, more or less on vacation. On vacations. And would you travel by car at the time? By car, yeah. So you, could I say then that you were or were not nervous about going to Paris Island? I wasn't nervous until I got there. And why did it change? Well, <laughs> you, you kind of expected it, but you really weren't ready for it. For the, basic training, you mean? basic. Till the drill instructors jumped on a bus and told us what to do, where to go, and then you start shaking. But you weren't worried because there's about 50 other guys on the bus, and so they were all in the same boat. Were they all about your age? Yes, they were. Very few and were older. So you get to Paris Island, and, and they kind of put the fear of God in you, so to speak. Oh, yes. And what else do you remember about basic training? Well, I, I'm writing a book, and it's, it's hard to say exactly. You'd have to read a book to find out what exactly took place. So many distant, distant, different instances. And are you br bringing that up in your book? Oh, yes. Name one that you can talk about. Well, as to what happened? 
it's, it's hard. It's hard to actually say what happened. There were so many different instances. I see. I couldn't really say it. Did you feel a closeness with the other um, Marines that were with you? No. I more or less was by myself and that's how I liked it. And while you were in BASIC, did you receive any special training? In BASIC? No, the same things that all Marines get, the history of the Marine Corps. Along with the history, what else on a daily basis did you learn? You learn how to march properly. You learn to be someplace at the right time. Punctuality. Yes, yes. What about sharpshooting or things like that? All Marines go to the rifle range. How were you at that? I was fairly well. I shot, I didn't shoot expert two years later, but I shot a regular standard. And how long was your Marine training for basic training? In basic. Approximately. Went in in December, December 7th and I got out in March. So about three months. Yes. And then where did you go? Then I went right back to Paris Island. I went to school in business administration. On the base? On, on the base. I went into the Marine Corps to get out of going to school. And, and all because I typed on a typewriter for about one second, they figured he's good. So they sent me the basic, uh, typing and basic business administration and filing and you did not skip school there believe me so did you find it ironic that here you are trying to get away from school you joined the marines oh, very and ironic. school yeah. but you did well no i goofed off on that because i didn't want that and if you goofed off would you get in trouble no you just try to make yourself look stupid there trying to get what you want and i eventually got it took me years, so. So after doing basic and then having some specialized training for administrative work, basically, that's yes. what it was, wasn't it? Yeah. How long did that last? Well, they, they took me into the file room at headquarters in Paris Island and showed me the walls full of files and said, when you get all these in the correct order, then you'll leave. And there was a room full of them and I was by myself. But it was interesting right, reading on some of the files too. What were some of them that were interesting? Some of them I can't go into. Could you mention anything? Not really. Were they about specific incidences or individuals or both? It was more or less like crimes, sex crimes and that. By Marines? By Marines. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't want to, you know. Were they, some of them dating back years or were they all recent? Recent were, and years ago and years too. Ago years ago also. So perhaps some from World War II that had occurred? No, it was at, the, at that time, it was up to date. Okay. Anything that happened on a base a record was kept of it and was put into the files. So it was specific to issues on the base? Yes. So the, did that surprise you that there were those issues back then? No, not really. I mean, I was young, but I wasn't that young that I didn't realize what it was all about. And were some of these individuals that, uh, were they court-martialed? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And what would happen to them? Well, they'd get a, they could go to prison. Depending how bad it was, they could go to prison and lose their ranks, lose their pay and allowances, and then get discharged, a bad conduct discharge. And when somebody got discharged with bad conduct, that was on their record forever, correct? Right, as and far as the military it, went. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult for them then to get jobs, do you know? No, not really. Okay. So you, how long did it take you to get the file room in order? Oh. About two or three months. That's all. That's great. Oh, yeah. So well, I had, when you have eight hours a day to do it in by yourself, you can go to town. 
So was it a lonely job or was it something that it was okay with you? No, it was just a job, an eight hour, you could say it was an eight hour job and then you were out of there. And what did you do in your off time? You know, your off time. I was too young to drink, so I more or less I went fishing in the various places that you could, you could go fishing. And we'd actually go sightseeing down the south because there's a lot of old mansions and that. And there's a lot of these beaches. And at that time, they, you didn't have the growth, the buildup that you have now down around the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. And you, I bumped into some kids from the south, and so they would take us around. And they were friendly towards you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these were Marines, but they were from the south. Mm -hmm. So they knew the area well? Yes. So after the three-month period, what happened? After, then they, they called me over to headquarters and told me, White, you're going to go to California, which meant I was going to go overseas. And where was overseas at that time? Korea. Because things were building up in Korea at yeah, the time? Yeah, oh, they were building up okay. So this would be in 1950? 1950, yeah. Okay. So was a, your unit going or just you and a few? Just me, because they called me into the office and they told me, here's your ticket, you're going by yourself over to California. We don't want you going on the troop train and ruin the young Marines. Because they were too new and you had... No, I was bad. I was bad all the way, but I managed to stay out of the jail. On so the they wanted to keep them separated from me because you were a bit I, I could lead them down the wrong road and I, I got a chuckle out of it myself because they gave me a ticket with the money for meals and I had to go to Chicago and from Chicago all the way over to California and the money they gave me I used it to drink on the train then I ran out of money and I was glad to get to California and at this point, you're around 18, aren't you? 18 years old at that point, almost 18? Yeah, okay. almost 18, yeah. So you get to California, and you meet up with your unit? No, they just threw me in with any unit there. Because if you had, I was by myself, and so I just went with any unit they put me in. And I, and I was happy because this is what I wanted. I didn't want to stay in a base in business administration. You wanted to see action? Yes. I regretted it later, but at that time. So you, were you put on a, a ship? No, we went through training over there. In California? In California, Camp Lejeune, Camp, Camp, excuse me, Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton. And how long was your training? A, few, a couple of months. It wasn't that long because you, you knew how to shoot. And they sent us up to the mountains there to get the training getting used to going up mountains, which I found out later, you needed the training. Because of the conditions in Korea? Right. That the at the time the you didn't know about? No, you did, we didn't know that much about Korea. I knew where it was, knew they were Orientals, but we didn't get that much training as far as the people go. And during your training, did they tell you also what the season and the weathers would, weather would be like? Or did you learn about that once you got over No, there? They, they tell you, you know, they, like they tell you that it's going to be cold weather training. So depending on the time of year, they will issue you cold weather clothing and that and equipment. And then you learn, you learn on the way what's happening. So once you finished your training in the mountains, you said it was about one or two months, then did you get shipped over? Yes, we went by ship. We went, we went down to San Diego and boarded the ships. We had two troop ships that were going over. Was that an okay experience? I've heard from others that we've interviewed that it was difficult for some just being on the ship. Do you remember anything about that? Oh, yes, uh, because I, they, they go by your name and your specialty number. And my specialty number was business administration. Once you get a specialty number, it's like a tattoo, it stays with you for your life. And so a lot of my buddies were, their MOS was infantry, where mine was business administration. So we got on board ship, and 
They said, well, what are you doing? Because a lot of guys were put to work on board ship. They said, what are you doing, Dwight? And I said, I got a lot of work to do. You'll see you later. Anytime somebody started asking me what I was doing, you know, I'll see you later. I had a clipboard with some papers and a pencil. And for 18 days, I walked around the ship. <laughs> and uh, Looking busy? Looking busy and doing nothing. One time I was in one of the squad bays on board ship there, and I saw two officers come in the far door, and there was no escape for me, so when they got closer, I just knelt down and looked under the bunks like I was inspecting for cleanliness. And then I stood up and good, good morning, sir, good morning, sir. And I passed them, and they, they didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I knew what I was doing, I was getting out of their way. And so then I got lost, and I would hold on to that clipboard until it was like a certain time of day, then they tell everybody to secure from work. And so for 18 days, I was either writing letters or else wandering around meeting people. But like I say, I had, I had ways of doing things that kept me out of trouble. So once you reached South Korea, yeah. where did you land? We landed, South Korea, we landed at, I think it was Pusan, I'm not sure. We landed on the East Coast, the southern tip of Korea on the East Coast. What was the first thing you remember about? Uh, that place stunk. Why? It was a land, when I say the stink, you could smell it. And what was the smell? Do you remember? It wasn't a, it wasn't a nice fragrance. And it, it's sad to say. And what time of year was this? In the fall. I think we landed around Thanksgiving time, around that part of the... And was it cold? It was starting to get cold, yeah. And when you landed, where did you go? Did you have a base there? No, there were no bases, but they, again, they put me in doing office work. <laughs> so they set up headquarters? In some little town, yeah. There's no South Koreans there, but... And then what changed? They found out that I wasn't doing good work, so they sent me up the line. So you were with the infantry? Right, what I wanted in the first place. And, and, and how did your days change then, when you're up the line, as you said, with the infantry? What were you doing? Where were you? Where were you staying and sleeping? They sent me to what they called Dog Company. There was a unit I was sent to dog company in the 5th Marines. They were on line. And so when one of the supply trains went up to the line, I would just simply fell in with them, packing all my gear, my rifle, and just followed them. When I got to the line, I just reported to the CO, and he in turn would send me down to whoever was weakened guys. In other words, they would strengthen the line by a, five guys were gone, while well, they would fill it in with five new guys. And when you say they were gone? Either their time rotated them home again, but usually they were either dead or wounded. And when you say on the line, was it right on the North and South Korean line that you were? There was no set, there was no set line. The line would travel up and over, a ridge down in the valley, back up, all the way across Korea. Mm -hmm. And when you were with the infantry and you were going over, the, it was a mountainous region? Oh, yes. Very big and you mountain. were walking most of the time or were you in trucks? <laughs> no, you were walking over there. There was no, like the first place I went to, there was no road going up there. There was no, there was no way you could make a road. You had to walk. They had a trail and you just followed the man in front of you. And while you were doing this, did you meet up with the enemy or enemy fire at that time? No, you could hear it, you could but hear it. nobody was actually shooting at us at that time. Yeah. So how, when you're talking about walking this distance, how long did it take you 
to do that. Did you go to a certain point each day? No, you just kept walking to until you got to your certain area that you're going to be joining up with. But as far as trucks taking us here or there, that didn't come till later on. By that time, everything was walking up the hills. So you're with the unit and you don't really know anyone, correct? No, you don't. Was that difficult for you? No, it didn't bother me. And then when it came time to sleep, did you sleep in tents or sleep out in the open? Out in the open. They had what they call bunkers. And you were usually, like I was a new guy, so they would put me with an old guy and he would in turn teach me what to do and when to do it up on a line. Such as what? Well, when you went on watch at night, before you went on a watch, you would look out over the terrain and you would, and he, I was taught by the, the old timer to count five stumps here or there. Because when it started getting dark, if you counted six stumps, something was wrong. It might have been an enemy. Trying to creep up, right? right? And, you, and your eyes actually got used to the darkness, which is hard to believe because there's no lights up there. And so as it got darker, you just more or less, was, you'd scan the territory in front of you. And my first night online was when I saw the enemy. I was watching down below me and I saw this gook officer wave to his men to come on. He kept waving to him to come on. And my heart was down to beat. I was scared to death. And so I waited till he kept calling his men. So I said, how if I'm gonna die? I'm going to take some of those guys with me. So I start throwing grenades. You had all the grenades you wanted, boxes of them. You were not to fire your weapon because I could tell if there's a rifle here, there's a machine gun there, there's a rifle here. So, but you could throw all the grenades you wanted because you weren't giving away your area. So after a while, it stopped and he stopped. And so I, I was wide awake. Now, when you went to throw these, did you tell anyone with you, was somebody nearby that you could tell them? No, because I didn't even know where the next bunker was. Okay. He was so many yards away. So you had permission to do this? <laughs> no, you didn't wait you, for permission. You didn't wait for permission. You just did it. You knew what to do. Mm -hmm. So you had no radio contact with anyone? Oh, no. Okay. You were by yourself. How big was your bunker? Just enough for one guy to lay down in okay. with a sleeping bag. So and then you, you had a fighting hole, okay. which I showed you the pictures, and that's where you stood during the day and the night. But in back it was a, a, a hole that you could crawl into when it was your time to sleep. So you throw this, these grenades, <clears throat> you're all by yourself. Your heart is beating. It was beating. And what else did you do? Well, the next morning, the guys in the next bunker when it got daylight, they said, what the hell were you doing last night? Who are you throwing the grenades at? Then I found out that gook officer who was waving his men on was a broken branch that was waving in the wind. Ah. Oh. You know how that's, they say in that, your eyes play tricks on you? Yes. Well, they certainly played tricks on me that night, but I killed the, the tree limb anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your first night? That was my first night. Tell us a little bit more about when on, what went on. Well, after that, you, it seemed like once you got over your initial fear, you know, you kind of watched and, you know, things didn't come along smooth. Then another night, you heard that saying, the, the hairs on the back of your neck stand right up. Well, it's true, again, I'm sure it happened to other people, but I was watching out in front of me and the wind blows up the valley and the mountains and if you get too close to the edge, the wind hits you in the eyes and it waters up your eyes and you lose all your vision in the dark. And so you would just stand back, you could feel the wind whipping, but you wouldn't get out that far. And so I was on watch, then the hairs on the back of my neck just stood right up. And I said to myself, somebody's in back here. And so I had an automatic rifle, which can fire 20 rounds with no problem. 
And so I didn't know how close this person was. So I just took one hand and kind of shielded the vision from whoever was in back of me. And I lifted up that automatic rifle and it was on full automatic. And so I said, well, I'm gonna make my move now because I didn't know if he's gonna jump down, bend at me or what. So I took it and I whipped around quickly. I spun around quickly. And when I did, the person was about 10 feet away. And so the only thing that saved his life was he was tall. That was the only thing that saved his life. If he was as short as me, I, he would, I would have riddled him. What it turned out to be was an officer, second lieutenant was going down the line, seeing if he could catch anybody asleep. And he doesn't real well, he, he yeah. obviously realized quickly that he could have been killed. Oh, killed, I would have cut him in half. Yeah. And they wouldn't have done a thing to me. Yeah. They might have moved me out of that company to another company. But again, you know, there's been so many cases of people being killed accidentally. Well, it's uh, tough if they were the ones who did what they did. How did, how, how was your, you had such fear the first time you said yes. with your heart beating and your, the, the hair on your neck stood, stood up as it you did, said. Yeah. When you saw who it was, what was your feeling? Were you angry? I, I let him know how close he came to being killed. It, like I say, it wouldn't have bothered me. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't have bothered me because he did what he did was wrong. Mm -hmm. Because other guys who came near my fighting hole, we call it a fighting hole, and they found out that that kid's, you know, kind of on edge. So they would come down a trail and they'd be whistling. They'd be whistling, hey, Whitey, how are you? You know, it's only me. <laughs> but there had to have been other Marines who also felt the same way, not just you. Oh yeah, we had, when we, you get new guys in line replacing other guys like myself. And so one Marine thought he was scared one of the newcomers and he crouched down the trench and was going up the trench line. And he didn't last long because the newcomer, he riddled him, he killed him dead. And uh, let it come around. Let uh, this, uh, the word came around from the commanding officer saying, "I'm going to write to this boy's parents, meaning the one who got killed." And here's what I'm going to say: Joe Joe Blow got killed by rifle fire, which he did while defending a key position in North Korea, where we were. And so. Uh, you know, that was just a case of friendly, you heard a friendly fire. A lot, of, a lot of servicemen get killed by friendly fire. Like that football player we read about there, Stillman? Uh, I just forget. recently, yes. the past few years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, he was killed by friendly fire. Mm -hmm. It's a shame, mm -hmm. but it happens. Mm -hmm. So when you're on the line, and you're first on the line, how many days were you there before you were relieved for a bit and then went back. How did that work? Oh, you went, you went online, you stayed there days, weeks after weeks. In the same location or moving up s slowly? Moving to the left or the right. In other words, sometimes if some company gets walloped, they would take you and move your whole outfit over to, you know, fill up that hole. And did you know going into this where the location, the end result was for you to be? No, uh, I went, they said, Bob White, go here, go there. I went. I, you know, I didn't look at any maps. They didn't have any maps of Korea. In fact, the maps they used were made by the Japanese when they occupied Korea years before. But like I say, they say, go here, go there. It didn't bother me, I went. So tell us a little more about some of your experiences. Um, what, what was your rank, first of all, at that point in time? PFC. And you were on the line going forward, obeyed whatever they asked right. you to do. Tell us about some of your experiences. Well, another time that was a close call was 
they told us we had to put out more barbed wire because there's only a few strands. And so during the day, you can move around in the open without any chance of getting hurt. Now, why was that? Because it's daylight and we had guys on watch, but the goose were not going to come up to our lines during the daytime. At night, yes, but not during the day. And so one time we were told to lay the barbed wire down at a certain area in front of our lines. And then they said, be careful that there might be landmines down there. But supposedly the landmines were cleared out of there by engineers who knew what they were doing, supposedly. And so you start looking around. You don't see a landmine. It's not above ground. There's just two little prongs. And so uh, one of the kids got nervous and jerky, and he started walking backwards away from the area of the mines. And the next thing I heard was a whoomp. I turn around and his body comes sailing back down. And what it was was the only thing that saved me was that the ground was frozen and the explosive charge did not go sideways. It went up in the air and he happened to step on it and he went up with it. He came back down. Well, as soon as I saw him, we hobbled for the corpsman the Navy doctors in a way to come. And I went over there and I just looked at the guy and I just knew that nobody was gonna save him. Nobody's gonna save him because the landmine just ripped the front of his legs and body and everything. And he's making these ungodly sa sounds. And a corpsman came and he jumped over the wire and I held on to the kid, the kid, I mean, I was a kid myself. And I held on a kid while he, I gave him my knife and he had to make a incision in his throat to get his airway. Again, I knew that wasn't gonna happen, it's just gonna be temporarily. And then after they came and took him away in a stretcher, I said, hey, let me have my jacket back. And you got my knife, my jack knife, you know. Oh, here, here, you know. I mean, and, you know, and the days go on, the war went on. So there had to have been a part of you that had to cut off any kind of feelings. Oh, Is yeah. that what happened? Yeah. That night I had a, you know, I did some soul searching there and then. And the next day it was better him than me. That's how I was, better him than me. So did you see a lot of death around you? Not as much, much as some guys did. But like I say, it didn't bother me after that. The first time was the most difficult. Oh yeah, the first time. Were you wounded at all? Later on in the year I was. How? Tell us about that. Well, the commanding officer and some of his second lieutenants and the first sergeant, they had to go down the rear to a meeting. And so they told me and the second lieutenant to hold the fort. In other words, stay in the headquarters part of the line. And so uh, they went down the rear and everything was just another day in the line, nothing happening. Then all of a sudden we, I could, we could hear the fins or the mortars cutting the air. You can hear it. Like somebody throws something at you, you can, you can hear it coming in. So I, I took a run and dive for my hole in the ground. And so when it exploded, it uh, caught about, about six of us, I say, because when the mortar rounds explode, the fragmentations, the fragments go all over the place. And so uh, it caught one kid in the lung, caught another kid on the back, it caught me in the back, and it caught this Puerto Rican and nearly severed his arm. And so, but now, now when I think of it, what set it off was when the mortar rounds were sent in flying, when they light the stoves to try to give you a hot meal online, they light them and you see a big cloud of black smoke go straight up. And that was like an aiming stake. It was like an aiming stake telling the gooks, you're right on target. 
I mean, we didn't learn about that till later. Later, sure. And so then we had to take these guys, get them patched up. Now, and when you say these guys, that's you too, correct? Yeah, but I was nothing compared to these guys. And then we had to call in the helicopters because the guy with his arm nearly severed off. They, I believe, they he actually saved it for him. So the corpsmen really played an important role. Oh, the corpsmen are great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You call him Doc. Yeah. So you got injured <clears throat> in your back. Yeah, Do you remember the feeling? It was just hot shrapnel. Mm -hmm. So did you have to go to get it removed? I just went to the rear by Jeep and they pluck it out of you there. Did they have to stitch you up? No, I didn't require stitches. Yeah. And then you just patch up and go back online? Yeah, usually they give you a shot of a sick bay alcohol and then send you back online. And that was okay with you? Oh yeah, yeah. didn't bother me. So tell us some more, you were wounded. Did you get any special recognition for that? No, I was recommended for the Bronze Star. But uh, the commanding officer, this Colonel Sowathon, he said he don't need it. <laughs> Was it because of your reputation? Kind of. Did you ever think about pursuing the Bronze Star? No, you can't get a second lieutenant to go over the head of a captain in the Marine Corps. Now, who was the second lieutenant? I, I never found out. I tried to find his name, but I could never find out. He was the one that recommended you? Yes, mm -hmm. he was one of the new second lieutenants. But like I say, for a second lieutenant to go over the head... Uh, but I mean, you today, couldn't you pursue that? I tried, but forget it. Mm -hmm. Too much time has, has elapsed. So you talked a little earlier about the climate. It was cold. Were you equipped for the weather and for the terrain? Yes, the first winter over in Korea, a lot of guys got frostbite, a lot of them died, a lot of them lost limbs. Then by the time the second winter came around, which I was in, a lot of this gear that kept fly, flowing over to us, they'd try this, try that. They were doing everything in their power to get a, a cold weather, a cold weather gear. And we ended up with these so-called Mickey Mouse boots. They were like thermo boots that they have now. And they helped? Oh gosh, yeah, they saved, saved a lot of toes and a lot of feet and that. So how long were you over there? Approximately a year. And was it for you, was it the daily routine of being on the front line and then moving forward and moving forward and seeing lives lost and getting injured and going yeah, back? Yeah, you were just one of the guys. How did that affect you emotionally? It didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. You knew enough to keep your head down. Mm -hmm. What did you do on your off time? You had to have had some off time. Oh, in the summertime we'd go swimming We'd find a, a creek or a watering hole. We'd go swimming. Then a gook say, so we were having a good time. So they throw some mortars in at us there. That's when you pick up your gear and you run naked through the woods to get to safety. Sure. <laughs> but it ruined our so-called watering hole. Now, when you were there, did you interact with any of the South Koreans? servicemen? No, I had nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. And did you have any kind of what we call R&R, &R, where you actually got a break to leave the area and go relax somewhere else? No, only a few guys got R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. So you did not? No, I did not. While you were there, were you able to write home or receive mail? Oh yeah, no problem writing home or getting mail from home. So you were there for almost a year. Did you see success while you were there, that, that they were considered winning the war, so no, to speak? No, policy-wise, uh, we, could, we could care less. At least that was my opinion, because nobody told you what was going on or that. 
So you were there to do your job, as right. you mentioned earlier, go where they told you to go. Put your time in. Put your time in. Then hopefully you go back home in one piece. And did you? Yeah, yeah. And what, what, what time of year and what year did you go back, come back? You went over in 1950, I think you said around... I think I came home in 52. 52, 1952. So at this point, are you what, 20, 21 years old, 20 years old? I was 20 years old, yes. Did it make you grow up fast? No, uh, it was uh, just something that happened and as long as you would go home in one piece. So you left Korea after putting in your time. How did you get back home? By troop transport. Where did you land? In Treasure Island in California. And did you stay there for a while? Just a couple of days until they checked you out. Navy doctors checked you out. And then what? And then they gave you your orders as to where you're going to go. And where did they tell you you were going? Well, they told me, Bob Boyd, you're going to Boston Navy shipyard. Was that good news for you? That was good news. Mm -hmm. And so did you take a train to get back here? I think I flew. Okay. There was a lot of heavy drinking going on. Was there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Was that a problem? What? Heavy drinking? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Okay. With some of our interviewees, they did mention that it was a problem, so that's why no, I yeah. ask. No, I didn't have any problem at all. So you got back here. Did you have some time off before you had to report? Right. Everybody got 30 days, as they call it. And you came home to Natick? Yes. What was it like coming home after what you experienced over in Korea? No problem. Did you talk about it? No. Did people ask about it? No. Mm -hmm. At that time, were you married or going with anyone special? No, that's why I didn't have problems because I wouldn't go on with anybody, so I wouldn't be leaving anybody behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had 30 days off. And then you had to report to the Navy shipyard? Boston Naval Shipyard, yeah. And what did you do there? They stuck me in an office. <laughs> Again? <laughs> Again. And was that okay with you at that point in time? At that time, yes. Mm -hmm. It didn't bother me in the least. And how long were you there for? A few months before I got into an auto accident. How did that happen? Too much drinking, I believe. Were you driving? Somebody was. <laughs> it must have been me. <laughs> and did you get injured? Yeah. How? What kind of injuries? Uh, head and face injuries, yeah. And you were hospitalized? Yes. And you, were you in the VA or were you no, in... No, Chelsea Naval Hospital. Chelsea Naval. How long were you in the hospital for? I don't remember. Really? Yeah. It's a lot I didn't remember. Were there severe injuries? Oh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did that affect your family, coming home from a war or a conflict that took many lives, and here you come home safely, and then you get in a severe car accident? I don't think it really bothered them either. Was it a typical Bob White incident? Is that yes, what I'm hearing yeah, here? Yeah, you're right. That's what you're hearing. Yeah. That's so, when I, I was in the hospital. And when I could walk around, they said, go down to the child line. And I saw this guy go by me. He's in a wheelchair. And he had the blanket over him, and he went right to the head of the line. Then we get back up into the squad bay late. I says, did you have an operation? He says, no. I said, what the hell are you doing with a blanket over here in the child line? He says, oh, listen, I'll keep it quiet, but... There's a, the next squad bay to us is full of wheelchairs. Get a blanket, have somebody push you, and you go to the head of the line, which I found out that's what they do. And so I'm in the line, I get the blanket over me, looking down, woe is me, oh, woe is me. And not one of the Navy captains, she was a beautiful redhead, 
She come along, she took one look at me, she says, White, get the hell out of that wheelchair. <laughs> and I said, oh, Jesus, you know, I'm healed, I'm healed. And so I got, I got out of the wheelchair, pushed it back up there, and I was just so embarrassed, I couldn't even go to the jar line that night. <laughs> she didn't push it, but it was funny. So yeah. did you finish off your um, service during that time, or did you continue on? Let me see, where did I end up? I ended up down in Camp Lejeune. They sent me from Boston Navy Shipyard to Camp Lejeune. And what did you do there? Did you do more office work? I was sent down there to take part in the duty uh, office work for the National Rifle Association. They're having a big rifle meet down in Camp Lejeune. And so I worked with a major in the Marine Corps. And life was good because I was my own boss. I would take all the correspondence put it where it's supposed to be, and then each day I had to type a letter to the commanding officer of Camp Lejeune as of what was taking place, because we hadn't had a rifle meet down there in years. And he would get a paper or a letter or a document every day as of what was going on and how things were going. And then it would go to the file room someplace and they would take care of it. Somebody and else doing the filing, not you. And not me. Yes. And it was working out good. And then when he was, uh, then when he was caught up with all the work, he would say, "Okay, wait. Well, there's nothing else to do. We're all set to go with the National Rifle we'll Meet." And I thought, oh, "Well, sir, if there's, there's nothing for me to do, why don't I just find time for me to do something?" He said, "Okay, you're excused." So I got a truck. And I would go fishing. Then I would just simply look, keep an eye on my watch, and then we would go to Chow, go back to the barracks. Then the colonel, full bird colonel, called me and he said, "White, he says, you're going to be NCO in charge of special services." And I, fine, you know. And so then the stripes start coming my way with no problem at all. And how long were you NCO there? Until I got, let me see, until I got discharged? Yeah, until I got discharged. And how long was that between getting the stripes and the discharge, approximately? A couple of months, a couple of months or so. So you, when you left the service, your rank was? Sergeant. Sergeant. Were you happy to get out? No, that's that's hard to say. You know, I would I would have liked to have joined. But, you know, it's kind of hard. And once you were out, so you left Camp Lejeune, did you come back to Boston? Yes. And yeah. what did you do then? What did I do? Did you get a job? Oh, yeah, I was never without a job. Mm -hmm. I got back and I immediately went to work for the registry, unloading license plates. Then I worked up in Jordan Marsh in the toy department, real hard job around Christmas time. And then, uh, then I then I got out. And you settled in Natick. Yes. Did you join? Um any military organizations? I joined the uh, BFW. I joined the AMVETS. And I, and I joined the reserves, Marine Corps Reserves. In other words, that was to hold my stripes. So if I ever went back into the Marines, I would have my stripes already. Did you use the GI Bill to your advantage? No, to tell the truth, I really didn't. Um, when you came back, did you attend any reunions of your old groups, outfits? No, because I really didn't know that many people. Uh, you, I wasn't that close to many guys. 
how did you have mixed feelings about coming back home? No. It was all, we just simply picked up where you dropped off. Mm -hmm. Having grown up in Natick and knowing that there were others who did also go into the service, not necessarily with you, but did you hear of good friends or acquaintances from back here, from Natick, who didn't make it back? Just from, uh, there was a Hubbard from South Natick there, family down there. When I was over in Korea, somebody said, why, why come up to the line there? Because uh, we got somebody from Natick, which is very rare. And so I walked over there and I met this young, young second lieutenant. His name was Hubbard. His name is on a stone down there in the park. Here downtown? Downtown, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we just chit-chat around there and then he he happened to move to another company because it was a case of, you know, to fill in. And then, then one of the guys said, White, you know that lieutenant you met? I said, yeah. He said, it got killed the other day. I said, how did it get killed, you know? He was killed by a mortar. Just, you know, you're here today, you're gone tomorrow. You just never know. And so I felt bad, but I didn't really meet his family because I, I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I, didn't know, I wouldn't know what to say to him. Young guy, nice guy. So you picked up where you left off in Natick. Yeah. And, and what did you do? You, you started out with some odd jobs. Did you pick up on any particular job that you then retired from after some years, or did you do different things over the years? No, I did different things until I got older and older. Mm -hmm. And I went to the public works, and I stayed there. I put in 32 years there. Natick Department of Public Works? Uh -huh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How important to you was serving in the military? I enjoyed it. I have had no bad feelings about it. In fact, if they knew what I did half the time, I'd still be in prison. <laughs> I had a way of getting into trouble and getting out. Were you that way in school here also? I think they're glad I went. Okay. How, do you feel in some ways if it affected your life after coming back? What, the Marine Corps? Right. Oh, it made me smarter. In what way? Don't get caught doing stuff. Would you like an instance of what I did? Sure. I had a very good friend in Korea, and we're getting a ride up by a truck up back up to the lines, and he nudged me, and I looked over, and he pointed, and I saw a gallon can of American cheese on the truck. And you don't get American cheese in your rations. So <laughs> we made our, we, we talked as to what we're going to do. And when the time came, the truck had to slow down to do a hairpin turn, and it would be exposed to the Koreans, and, because you could always see the, the flash of their binoculars. And so the plan was, as it stopped and shifted gear, then it would start up again. We jumped off, we took the gallon cheese with us. And a guy saw the can in the, under our arms and he hollered, but he had to keep going because he couldn't back up or else he'd be mincemeat for the gooks. So he hollered and swore at, uh, swore at us. And he took off up the road and we took off down the road. And we got to the woods and we went through the woods there. And we just said, the hell with the landmines. We had a gallon of American cheese. So we went through the woods and we got to his bunker. We went inside his bunker. We took a bayonet and we seesawed it like a can opener. We just took out gobs of American cheese, stuffed it in our mouths, and ate as much as we could, which wasn't that much when you have a gallon. 
And so he said, let's go up to it and see what they got for chow tonight. So he walked up the trail to the, where the guy was cooking. And all the guys were in front of him. And he was doing the hooting and hollering and swearing. And as we get closer, we got the words that if we ever find out who stole that cheese, we'll kill the son of a bitches. And all the guys were in unison, yeah, yeah. So me and my buddy looked at one another. We inhaled. We never let out a breath until we got down the trail. Then we broke out in a gallop. And so he got to us, what are we going to do? We we're going to dig a hole and bury it. That can of cheese is still in Korea. <laughs> And it's well preserved because it's two feet under the ground. Were they serving it as part of the meal? What is was supposed to be was a cook said, I had a surprise for you guys tonight. I was going to make cheeseburgers. Oh. That's when we knew our fate was sealed. Oh, dear. If they ever found out. <laughs> so we dug a hole and buried it. That is priceless. Oh, that is in the end of it. We took tubes of toothpaste and squeezed them into our mouths chewed it, swallowed it, spit it out. More water kept blowing into one another's face. Can you smell it? I think so. So more toothpaste, more water. And this kept up for about 10 minutes. Then we didn't think we could, well, we didn't go with anybody that night. The and smell I, of cheese on your breath? That's what we were afraid of. Sure. It probably wasn't there, but we didn't, we weren't gonna try it. So that, that was funny after we got home. But it wasn't funny over there. No. Because these guys would kill you. The next guy would stand in line, would kill you. The next guy would kill you. Sure. It wasn't funny, not when we heard, well, I have a surprise for you guys. A lot of things <laughs> happened, you know, that. So you had to have a little bit of humor because it was a tough life, wasn't that it? That wasn't humor, not when we found out what, who the cheese was going to. It was going to us. But we didn't know, we just said, there's a can of American cheese, let's steal it. That was okay. In the Marine Corps, you can steal, but don't get caught. Sure. It's a model sin if you get caught. Uh, there was a lot of different funny instances that happened over there. One time, my buddy I went over to visit him. He was online. And I said, what's the matter? He was crouched down. And he, was, he said, the gooks are shooting over there and I can't put up my flag. I said, you chicken, I said, give me the flag. So I took his flag and I waited until the firing slowed down and they re were reloading. And I jumped up on the trench line and took his flag and I sunk it in the sand from there. Then I jumped down again. And so I had time, that they had time to reload and then they cut loose and there was bullets flying all over the place. But I mean, uh, it just, it's a case of, if they're aiming at you, they're not gonna hit you. It's when they're not aiming, that's when you get hit. But like I said, there's so many stories, that it's funny. So it was almost an adventure for you. Oh yeah. And yet there were times when you were afraid. Oh yeah, the first, first time online, that's when I was afraid, but then you get over that. You never really get over being scared. But, you know, different things happen. Is there anything else as we finish this up that we haven't asked, or is there anything additional that you would like to comment on before we complete this tape? No, not really. Like I say, I'm writing, I'm writing a book at home. Do you have a name for the book? The name it will be, I'm trying to think. I got a mental block. But I'm writing in a book for my kids. I'll give for your kids. For the kids. Because they always say, like, you hear this story, Daddy, what did you do in the war? You know. That's a good name for the book. Uh, the name of the book will be, And When I Go to Heaven. Mm -hmm. That'll be the name of it. Well, Robert B. White, Bob, we want to thank you for coming in today. Uh, a lot of information here, I think, is important for people, not only your family, but others to hear. So thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, I'm we glad appreciate I could, I'm it. I'm glad I could make it. Good. And you finally told me to make it. I, I, I asked, yeah. and I'm glad you did. Yes. Thank you.